from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Yama Garaninda Mariina. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to First Nations Australia uh, Writers' Session. Very, very privileged to be here. Um, I think it was a surprise to all of us too that we actually um, uh, are here too and it's just it's quite exciting to be at such a great event. Um, we have three sessions today, um, one after each other and um, just different topics and we want to sort of at first I guess introduce you a little bit to Aboriginal Australia and then get our writers to fill in um, the gaps and tell you a little bit about their own writing in terms of um, Aboriginal cultures in Australia. Um, Aboriginal people make up probably 2.5% uh, of the Aboriginal population. There are over 300, more than 300 language groups um, with around five or 600 dialects in those. Um, we, we believe, and apparently um, the other two will tell, will, I'm sure will confirm this, but uh, we are the oldest continuing cultures in the world with no break um, in our um, cultures. Um, I'm just trying to think of all the things. First off, before I start, actually, I want to do something that we do in Australia. And um, we do a what we call a traditional acknowledgement. Um, we don't come into an area um, unless we meet with the original owners or the tra uh, traditional owners. We're um, very lucky to um, connect with some Native Americans while we're here. But I wanted to first off, pay my respects, and this is something that happens in Australia, even in Parliament. We acknowledge um, the traditional people of that area. Um, so I, if my pronunciation on these names isn't very good, but apparently I've, we've come into an area that has quite a lot of um, uh, original owners, so I'm just going to give you a, some of those names. Um, and it's also about us um, acknowledging from our cousins on Turtle Island that um, we, um, you know, are grateful to be here in, in their country. So if I don't pronounce it right, someone could correct me, please. But I um, want to pay acknowledgement to the Piscataway, um, Chickahominy, uh, Mataponi, Mataponi, uh, the Monacan, um, these are terrible pronunciations, Nutterway, um, the Pornanki, um, and the Rapa... <laughs> There's a couple more there. It's, not, it's very strange to my language. But, you know, um, the other side of that welcome is that we, um, all elders in the audience and people that are there, we also like to acknowledge their presence because it's only through the stories that elders pass down, grandparents, aunties and uncles pass down, that we are able to also maintain our cultures. But it, it, it's... Um, something that is right around the world. That's how you keep your family stories. So I'd like to acknowledge all the um, elders in the room too and thank you for coming. My name's Cathy Craigie. I'm the Executive Director of First Nations Australia Writers Network. We're a, um, a group of writers across Australia nationally. Um, we, our aim is to enhance um, not only our writers and their literature but also to educate people about our own cultures um, in Australia. So I thought we might just start off with a couple of things. I told you a few things before um, that we, you know, the oldest continuing nation, um, cultures in the world. Um, ev it changes all the time. Anthropologists try to put dates on when we came, but I'm sure some of the other writers will talk about this, but there's always, you know, it's changing. I think it's up to around 60. 70, it's gone to 60, 000. 60, 70. That's that's actually just the living culture, but there's um, of course lots of um, evidence and artifacts that we've been around since time immemorial, and um, we're very proud of our culture, and we um, feel that it, you know, something that we want to tell the world about. Um, we have, uh, um, I guess, our, our protocols and our and the way that we work spirit. Uh, in terms of spirituality and that is, um, you know, there are a lot of common things with lots of other people around the world and that's one of the good things to start at a starting point is how um, we share those commonalities. Um, I will maybe just start off with um, our writers introducing you. Um, on the end up there is Dr Janine Le Lane. 
She's a Wiradjuri woman um, from southwest New South Wales. She has a doctorate in literature and Aboriginal representation. She currently holds a postdoctoral fellowship at the Australian University in Canberra. Uh, Janine's first volume of poetry, Dark Secrets After Dreaming, um, won the Scanlon Prize for Indigenous Poetry from the Australian Poets Union. And her manuscript, Purple Threads, won the David Yanipan Award at the Queensland Premier Literary Awards. And I'll just tell you, David Yanipan was um, the first Aboriginal published writer. He um, was quite an amazing man. If you've ever been to Australia and ever had the, um, been able to hold a $50 note, I don't hold them that much, but um, the $50 note has his picture on it. Um, he was not just, he wanted books published because he wanted to preserve our stories. He wanted to make sure that there was, you know, his, his children and grandchildren were able to, um, would be able to read those stories. Um, we, I'm sure his name will come up. Um, a little bit more. But one of the other amazing things about David Yanipe, and he was an inventor. And um, we're, today you'll probably find out a little bit more about how Aboriginal people not only influenced Australian cultures, but also what our um, contributions to the world. And one of the things that he actually did do um, was the aerodynamics of the, well, the, the helicopter and was based on, he was drawing because of the Australian boomerang. So we might, you know, we. I'm sure some people will ask, and Jared is from where David Yanipan comes from, so I'm sure David, uh, Jared will be able to share you some. So Janine, um, that's Janine, and, and on this side we've got uh, Dr Tony Birch, and I cannot find your bio. <laughs> that's unbelievable. Do you want me to give it? I reckon you should just give it. <laughs> um, He's going to take over anyway later. Dr. Tony Birch has a PhD in urban cultures and master. <laughs> Very handsome man. And master of arts in creative writing. His books include Shadow Boxing, The Blood, which was shortlisted for the Miles Franklin Literary Award, Father's Day, The Promised, and his new novel, Ghost River, will be released in three weeks' time. And currently, Tony Birch is a senior research fellow at the Mundani Balak Indigenous Unit at Victoria University in Melbourne, where he's re researching on the relationship between the humanities, climate change, and indigenous knowledge. He, he sounds like quite an amazing yeah, man. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're an expert on him. Um, so we might start off with Janine, and, and Janine, I just want to ask you first about, um, well, about your life, and tell us a little bit about you know where you come from, and so that we introduce the audience. Um, mm. They can. Okay, thank you, thank you, Kathy, and thank you everyone for coming. And can you hear me? Yes, okay. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I was born at Gundagai, which is a very important... Cathy mentioned um, that there are 300-plus uh, um, languages and for each language, for those languages, there's also a country. So I'm from Wiradjuri country, which is huge, and, it, and um, it's between three rivers. Uh, the borders of that country, and um, it's it's um, freshwater country, um, and we're freshwater people. And uh, my grandmother had the privilege of being born on country. My grandmother was born on country. Where we say someone was born on country, means they were born where their ancestors and their ancestors and their ancestors were born. And so I did have the privilege of being born on the country. And of the three important rivers that are there, the Murrumbidgee, the Lachlan and the Darling, um, the Murrumbidgee is the only one that's got its original Wiradjuri name and that's my river and it's the lifeblood of the story and the women in the story. Um, and interesting relationships to the river between white settlers and Aboriginal people. Uh, one of the important things that really plays out in this story. Um, and I'd just like to also say that um, country, country for Aboriginal people is not like this country is America or the United States. I know it is, but when we talk about country, we actually, it means more than that. Country for Aboriginal Australians is not just land or property. It's spirituality, it's genealogy, it's language. And most importantly, what I tried to bring out in Purple Threads 
was that it's also a, a place of collective memory and the oral histories of a people that, um, that con continue to connect us to the place and to the land. And country is also a state of mind as well as something that is physical and tangible. So you can be away from country, but you can still carry country in mind. Um, and on that note, if you would like to just briefly imagine my country, I could read you this brief passage. And if you close your eyes, I reckon you'll get there. Okay, this is from a story called Lying Dogs. And um, this basically, this is a story. This book, Purple Threads, is told through the eyes of a child. And it's a recounting of a number of adult conversations. As a child, my sister and I were raised by um, aunties, two aunties and a grandmother. And we had a mother and a father, <laughs> but they were very much in and out of our lives. And the stable thing in our lives, which are, is why the title of this book is very important for a number of reasons, because we're the aunties, so we're the purple threads Purple is a women's colour across the world, generally speaking, and it's a colour that's associated with strength and it was their favourite colour of things that they used to grow in the garden. Um, and so this is a story told through the eyes of a child which deals with some very serious issues like domestic violence, but not in the Aboriginal community because there is that unfortunate stereotype about violence in Aboriginal communities. This deals with violence in the white community and Aboriginal people who actually attend to a woman who's in a very serious situation. But I'm seeing this through the eyes of a child. And the story begins when this particular woman and her despicable husband move into um, our country on a farm next door and this is what the country is like. This is Wiradjuri. Country baked hard in January and sweat dripped like much needed rain from the red necks and burnt noses of pig farmers as they slaved in the hot sun to dig wallows for their suffering sows. And giant white sows, heavily pregnant, sweltered the long days away in the thick grey mud. The women in town sat in their cotton print dresses on cool verandas of grey-blue river stone and fanned themselves with imitation oriental fans as they drank weak tea from fine china cups. From time to time they pulled crisp white embroidered handkerchiefs from their handbags and wiped away the sweat that fell in big greasy sheaths of foundation and scented powder from their faded faces and their mascara ran like black tears. And Aunty Boo, who was my eldest auntie, said they looked like sad dolls and the sun glinted a spectrum of coloured rays from their tinted hair. The stones sat in the dry creek beds and braced their bleached faces against the midday sun and stared back at the thirsty land. It's very hot in January where I come from. At the edge of the crops on the plain, brown snakes rattled, rattled the hollow wheat and the ears clicked eerily in the hot wind and a spark could ignite a huge firestorm of dry grasses and grains that would burn like a furnace and the women at home always worried about bushfires. Babies born between November and January might not see rain until August, and the sound of it teeming against the tin roofs would see them screaming hysterically at their mother's breasts. If it did rain in summer, the smell was so strong and so sweet against the dry that I'd think nothing of flinging, my face, flinging myself face down in the mud, in the dust, to breathe it in, and when the big drops pounded on my back, I'd emerge, mud-faced and ecstatic, to dance in the rain with my sister. The farmers, their wives and the townspeople were always amazed and dismayed at the changing of the seasons. Aunty Boo said they were gammon, as for Rajuri word, for crazy, for silly. Aunty Boo said they were um, gammon because the seasons and the country always turns. The seasons turned and turned again as the river swelled and shrank dictating the course of all life around it and surrounding it. In August, 
in, the, in August rains, the Murrumbidgee would swell. Sometimes it would devour the trees on the floodplains and as the waters shrank, the river gums were adorned for months afterwards with, their sl with the slender skeletons of cattle and sheep swept away in flash floods. As the big brown waters receded through September, the land was bountiful with ducks, fish, goanna, kookaburra, platypus, frogs, snakes, grass and flowers. Through October, the green faded from the tall grass and the river swell subsided to a flow. Grass lilies of red, flame, umber, yellow, blue, pink, purple, mauve, cream and white carpeted the hills. And November saw the river flow slow and ebb as the grasses turned from olive to russet. The lilies wilted as the sun burned, drawing the last reserves of water from the earth and the musty, stagnant smell of drying water was pungent. In December, the grasses were bone and the lilies became brown balls and shook in the hot winds. Moths and butterflies and beetles made their way to the hills as reprieve from the swelter. The January dryness snapped the life and moisture out of the grass and leaves. And the earth faded from red to brown to beige. Country baked. Creeks became waterfalls and, river, and the rivers struggled. Stranded frogs f fled stalking snakes. February frazzled. The earth and the hills baked white and the quartz crystal caught in the sun's rays projected amethyst rose and blue through the long days. And through March and April, the days eased and the evenings began to bite. Night fires were lit. Grasses and reeds sprouted along the river. In May, cool winds blew from the south, heralding the winter. June was crisp, dry ice that coated the hills and clung to the naked boughs like beads. Ankle-deep emerald grasses were sugar-coated with frost. Intricate dew-clad spiderwebs spanned bare branches. By July, blankets of fog engulfed the river and the roads. Then the rain set in. August saw the big swells and deep water engorge the river again as the country turned and turned and turned again, resilient. Now that's one year in my country around the river as it dictates the seasons. And I guess the irony of the situation was that the farmers were always trying to struggle against this. Whereas as the Wiradjuri people knew how to live with these seasons because it was our country a lot of angst caused there by the, the um, settler presence because they couldn't control the environment and it was always so stressful for them. I think it was, uh, um, you know, when the British came to Australia, it was such a, as the Australian environment is, um, I think it's, most of the Australian land base is um, arid country and it's around the coast where most people live with the green, so, you know, um, it would have been quite a shock to them. And our people who um, intrinsically entwined with nature, everything in our lives um, came from that influence or that. And so down to, you know, um, having each family, clans, language groups had totems. We had several groups through. Um, for example, my own um, was on my father's side a black snake called Nure, on my mother's side a, a certain kangaroo called Banda, and it meant that we were not allowed, that they were our brothers or our sisters, we had to treat them that way, there was no, um, and, and in, in many ways that was um, um, about sustaining the animal and making sure that those animals continued. Um, of course after 240 years of um, um, non-Aboriginal settlement, many of those animals and plants have disappeared. Um, there's a beautiful story at the very beginning um, of the first contact in Sydney, which was the first area that was settled. Um, in the first three days, the uh, British government made, um, uh, divided up the men on the ship into um, groups. There were no women that came out first, it was just men. Um, and, you know, so they had the fishing group, there was another group that would, um, you know, they all had something to do. And there was a group that had to cut down the trees to, um, you know, make the houses, the shelter. And um, the men got quite disturbed because once they started cutting, they could hear this wailing sound. It was a mourning cry. And there were all these women coming out and they were just crying, coming over to the side and crying. And, the, and it frightened the British. They didn't know what was happening. Eventually they realised what was happening because the women were saying, you, you are hurting my sister, you are hurting my brother. Um, so you can see how we were intrinsically 
um, entwined in environment. I want to come to Tony, who has written quite a lot um, around this area, um, particularly on uh, what's happening in Australia in terms of climate change. We are the driest continent in the world, and so we've really got to be um, quite, you know, um, I guess determined and, and focused on what's going to happen to Australia in the next few years. Unfortunately, uh, we have some people in government who don't believe there's anything happening in the climate, that there's been no changes. So um, only in my country, uh, about five, six weeks ago, the Prime Minister announced a mine um, in prime farming land. Mm. Prime, um, you know, uh, not only prime farming land, but it was a lot of Aboriginal sites were in that area. So um, it's brought farmers and Aboriginal people and the Green Movement together. Um, and farmers were often very cons uh, on the conservative side in politics in Australia, but this is one where they've all come together because we realise that there's a shared future. So I'm going to pass it over to Tony to have a chat about, um, s about, your, about yourself first, tell us a little bit, and then into your writing. Yeah. Um, sorry, my, my mic is falling down. Um, my situation is different than, a, than some people, but not unique in the sense that I, I lived in the inner city of Melbourne, um, which is a city of about four and a half million people, and from about the Second World War onwards, it um, drew the largest Aboriginal population in Victoria. And while we live on Wurundjeri land, who are the um, original and traditional owners of Melbourne, the part of Melbourne that I come from at least, is that most of the Aboriginal people who moved to Melbourne during the Second World War and after the war actually came from parts all over Victoria, all over southeastern Australia, and in fact all over Australia. Um, one of the um, names we go by, our traditional name is Fitzroy Blacks, which is um, very exotic, and basically um, the Fitzroy Aboriginal community is the political heartbeat of the um, Victorian Aboriginal community. And I said earlier that I was the um, a senior research fellow at an Indigenous unit. Um, my position is actually named after a man, Dr. Bruce McGuinness, mm. who's one of the greatest Aboriginal activists in our history. And he grew up and lived a lot of his life off country, as Janine talked about, in Melbourne. And it's a very strange irony that I was the first recipient of that fellowship. And when I was a small boy, both myself and my older brother shared a single bed um, with Bruce who was a good friend of my father's, and little would you have thought that when you were a kid, not only have you got your brother in your bed, you've got your dad's best mate, you're all trying to get a bit of mattress to say, oh, one day you're going to be at a university and you'll be, your research position will be um, named in my honour, which no one would have thought, thought back then. What I would say in, in the sense of around writing and our community, it actually epitomises, I think, one of the great strengths of the Aboriginal community in southeastern Australia that we were the most incarcerated, certainly from the early years of invasion and contact. Our people were forced on to missions and reserves. Um, I was talking to our Native American um, brother here, Lee, before, and it's a very similar experience as happened here to the First Nations people. And um, language was taken from communities, culture taken from communities, and yet our communities have been able to take the English language, the technology of writing, and use it to the great advantage of our community, which shows our ability to adapt and utilise any technology, even if it's one that is created to repress us. Um, because I've always lived in the inner city, I haven't tried to make claims to how knowing the country in an Aboriginal way has to be about living outside cities. That's another one of our brothers there. Um, it's about me understanding country from the fact of it being very urban based and this is a story about a boy who grows up in the inner city of Melbourne in a very post-industrial period when basically what he has at his back door are very large factories and a very dirty river. So I'll just read that li little description. Loretta when Renwick always knew her son was a dreamer. It was from the day she spotted him looking up at the sky as a small boy. He was sitting on a rug in the public gardens watching the flight of a bird above his head. He soon began drawing them with crayons on the rough concrete ground in the backyard or on the footpath in the street. As he grew, he took his sketchbook everywhere he went, 
destroying train wrecks in the rail yards and mighty ghost gums growing along the river banks of the river. It was when he, where he spent most of his weekends alone roaming as far as he liked. Wren had a loose contract with his mother, one that Archie went along with despite his grumbles. As long as the boy was home before dark and as his mother would remind him, he brought no trouble to the family door. He was given a free reign. Only weeks after Sonny moved into the street, Wren decided it was time to share the river with him. The water was not easy to find and local knowledge was vital. A dirt track leading to the river lay in the shadows of the mill, hidden amongst the forest of wild thorn scrub and overhanging trees. At the bottom of the steep riverbank, another track skirted its edge. In one direction lay an iron bridge which carried traffic to and from the high side of the river where the moneyed people lived. In the other direction, a wooden pontoon nudged the bank, bobbing up and down with the current. The pontoon nestled next to the ruin of a wheelhouse. When the gates of the mill were shut, the giant wheel that drew water from the river to supply the mill had seized with rust. The wooden floors and foundations rotted and the building slowly sank into the muddy riverbank. From a distance, it resembled a red brick boat floating on water. Further upstream, a low waterfall stretched the width of the river topped with a concrete lo- ledge, maybe three feet wide. When the wheelhouse had been in operation, an iron handrail had been bolted into the ledge of the falls to transport workers from one side of the river to the other. The handrail had been swept away in a flood many years before, leaving crossing dangerous, particularly after a heavy rain when the water from upstream swept across the falls with ferocity. Wren knew his river as good as anyone and better than most. As well as drawing birds and other animals, his exercise books were increasingly filled with maps of the river, including sketches of swimming holes, the hollows where rabbits burrowed into the ground, the foxholes hidden beneath the barbs of blackberry and the drainways spewing out rubbish from the streets above. Wren's thoughts of the river were so constant, he sometimes woke in the night recalled an image of his most recent visit, opened one of his books and began drawing. Um, just the two points I'd add before we, we go back to Cathy is that one, that both this story and my experience is that basically we understood the country as the country was. In other words, it was an industrial city and we tried to make sense of the open spaces, the rivers, the, the um, wild parks as much as we understood the wrecks and ruins of the place. And in the book there is an old man text, an Aboriginal man who imparts to these young boys a secret history of the river, the river of Wurundjeri that lays below this polluted river. And it's a remarkable story, I think, again, of survival that even though what has happened to our country since the arrival of the British, since industrialisation, is the very strong story of pre-occupation Melbourne or our country that Wurundjeri hold to. Why I wanted to add that, it does relate to what Cathy said about my five-year research project on climate change, and that is that in Australia and globally, and we know in North America, if you want to understand the, the current issue around climate and what will happen in the future, Indigenous communities have great experience and knowledge of past climate change events, past damage to ecology and environment, and one of my most important driving forces for this project is to try and in, engage your wider community in saying there is knowledge held in Indigenous communities across the globe and if you work equitably with those communities, you actually will be able to deal with this current problem in a much more sophisticated way. Yeah, I think it's um, Aboriginal people lived through the Ice Age. We lived through a number of changes in the, um, in the land and the environment. Um, including, um, you know, Australia in the, the current shape of Australia. It wasn't always like that. Tasmania, that little island at the bottom, was once joined. There were other places joined, but our people have been around. We, um, in fact, uh, there's a place called Mungo, and I think Janine mm, yeah. will know a little bit about this, um, where they had found um, remains of megafauna. These were big wombats big kangaroos, big animals. Um, so our people have been around and as Tony said, mm. we've seen a lot of change and we adapted. We knew how to adapt to that change. 
I just want to um, go back on something that you talked about, the secret history of um, the country. And uh, it's definitely, a, a, you know, there is, a, there is a hidden history in Australia. There's a lot of, when you read most of the historical um, documents, it doesn't tell you a lot about some of the, you know, the Aboriginal side of the story of um, that country. And, and there are so many secrets, and they're not really secrets, we've known them, but um, often we've had to, when we, we don't always tell, we've had to protect our stories and protect our land, so we often don't tell um, publicly that this is an important area or that's an important area. And, you know, often it's been a conflict in Australia, particularly down to um, native title um, or land rights in Australia where Aboriginal people are saying this is, you know, we want uh, some affirmation and claim over this land. Um, and those secret histories aren't found, but a lot of that history is, again, entwined with the environment and the changes that have happened um, in Australia. So we might come back to Janine there. And um, Janine, you might want to tell us a little bit about Mungo and some of the stuff you did, but I also wanted to go back to you. You talked about being raised by your aunties, and it's a quite a common thing in Australia um, to not only, we have a very, you know, your extended family, we don't have such thing as first cousins, second cousins, no. third cousins. Your sixth cousin is your cousin. You know, um, and we also have very close relationships. Um, I know when, as kids growing up, one of the most fascinating things that you do is you, you have competitions about who's got the most cousins. Um, <laughs> and you claim a lot of people that aren't really your, your cousins, but just to add your number up. But that, that whole extended family, you're not always brought up by your parents. Um, in in a, a traditional sense, your mother's sisters are also your mothers. Yeah. Your father's brothers are also your fathers. And that's that responsibility that you're never really alone. There's always someone to look after you. Mm. Yeah, um, that's right. Um, I was raised by a nana. That's a grandmother. Um, and um, two aunties. And that's not uncommon. They were my mother's sisters. Um, when I was little, I used to call them both mum. Um, and the reason why I stopped doing that was because other kids at school didn't understand. And um, there's a lot in my book about two worlds operating simultaneously. There's the safe world at home. And an essay I wrote based on this book, actually, in a historical volume on Ergo Histoire, the self and the history, actually talks about the home world. It's actually called Home Talk. There's the world at home which is safe for you and where your culture is reinforced and where you hear the oral family stories that my auntie pass, aunties and nana passed on to me. And then there's a world outside, which is a very, very precarious place for the Aboriginal child. And um, ad when adults read my book, they sense this precariousness, but it was told through the eyes of a child because we had these strong aunties protecting us at home and that's another thing I want to touch on. People talk about Aboriginal activism. Um, yes, and there is plenty of people, there's public activism. But in this book, one of the things I wanted to do is bring to the forefront what I think is the iceberg theory of Aboriginal activism. For everybody out there waving a flag or a banner, and they're often the men, not always, but they're often the men, there is, you know, people at home, that's the tip of the iceberg, there's people at home that's floating that activism and that's the people like my aunties and there's, and other people's aunties. It's the home front activism which is usually carried out by the women um, who educate the children at home, not in the formal Western sense, although we are, and Tony said this, um, all very bicultural. Like we can, we do operate in two worlds, and we can, um, and that's a great source of frustration to settler people that you notice, and a tremendous sense of empowerment for us mm. that we can operate in these two worlds, whereas settlers can only operate in their own worlds. But we have so much exposure, and, and through force to the settler world, and through my Western education, um, which was at great cost at some times, as some of the stories in here will illustrate, but that which has helped me understand the Western psychic and has been a tremendous source of empowerment. And my aunties, like a lot of Aboriginal women, 
were domestic servants. That was considered an appropriate job for Aboriginal women, which meant they went into the houses of white people, usually wealthier white people, and were paid pittance if they were paid at all. Um, and my, a number, I had eight aunties, and um, was very, very close to two of them. And they had been domestic servants. Yeah, and they'd learned a lot about white psychic from being domestic servants, and that was tremendously empowering. So there's that irony there, that a servant may seem like a very diminished person, but actually their powers of observation will actually give them a lot of reserve and a lot of power about, um, about the people they're looking after. Thanks, Jeanine. I know we're getting to... Have we got ten, uh, We wanted to do some question time at the end, so we've got time for that. OK, I just wanted to touch back on something that um, you were talking about. Aboriginal Australia, multiculturalism. We were all multicultural because of, there were so many cultures. Um, these days, the biculturalism is the English language or uh, cultures and ours against that. But, um, Tony, how, uh, in terms of your own work, um, we'll finish with you before we open it up to the floor. Um, in terms of that, how have Aboriginal people been able to um, come through such a complex thing and still survive? I mean, after that, we're still here. I think that's one of the great successes of Australia is the fact that we haven't died out. Um, we're still um, here and we're, very, we're quite strong and, and some of that is probably due to the fact that we were so able to adapt yeah, and be have look, those I, multicultural. I, I, think, I, I think it's Janine said it. Um, I've done a lot of... I taught history at Melbourne University for about five years and did a lot of work. Most of my research work was on Aboriginal women, Aboriginal women's hmm. writing. Hmm. And... Um, Aboriginal people started writing English about five years after the British arrived. Um, wonderful quote in 1884 from a Reverend Bulmer at Lake Tyres, which is a terribly repressive reserve in Victoria. Um, Aboriginal people had been incarcerated there for about 15 years. They were incarcerated. Children were taken from families. Children were... All their language was taken from them. They were supposed to be schooled in English. In 84, Bulmer says, the worst thing we ever did was to give the native the power of writing because they've used it against us. So Aboriginal people were writing protest letters, petitions. But the cornerstone, and Janine is spot on, is that all the work I did, it was Aboriginal women incarcerated in those terrible situations, Aboriginal women living in suburban Melbourne, in mm. Sydney, mm. in country towns. Yeah. I have researched women who have written letters of demand, protest, the quiet activists for 40 years to government to, to demand ration food their children be returned, tin roof put on their top of their houses. If those women hadn't been at the forefront of that struggle, we'd exist, but I would suggest we'd exist in a much more possibly subservient way. So that, that's the key. And I think that, you know, in any Aboriginal community today, when you want to find how a community works with strength and value, it is a community where women have not an equal voice where women are running the show. We, we come from matriarchal, matrilineal um, lineage. Um, we, the mother is the, the focus, the, um, the backbone, we say, the backbone of um, our communities. Um, and it's interesting, Tony, you were talking about, you know, those letter writing. In 1821, a woman called Maria Locke in Sydney, um, what happened when Tony was talking about they removed our children, it was part of the, the process to try to... White, right, wipe us out. So they thought by bringing us into schooling systems and there was a, a place in Sydney called the Native Institute. And that Native Institute, there was uh, seven young Aboriginal women were brought there and they were asked to marry seven convicts on the ship. If they married these seven women, they would be pardoned. And one of the women was Maria Locke. She married uh, Robert Locke, an Englishman. He was illiterate, but she'd learnt to write. And so she, in, in that sense of law at that time, she was the, um, the head of the household. And she was the one who wrote the letter to Macquarie asking for the land back of her grandparents and she actually got off her father and her brother. And she actually got that land. So the women have played quite a big role. 
And I think if any of you have heard of, um, uh, there was a movie that was released many, a few years ago called Rabbit Proof Fence, mm. which is the story um, of uh, Doris Pilkington, um, who her mother story about being taken away and put and the same sort of things out as a domestic on a on a property a farm um, and that journey of coming back and 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 Doris you know the writer herself and her children are proof that um, um, you know all that struggle and, and hardship they were able to succeed through that so we might leave it we've got a couple of minutes for questions if people want to ask I know it's it seems like quite a short period but um, ask us anything we've got two more sessions we're trying to keep them to the themes but we're happy to talk. Oh, they're a good audience. They don't ask questions. <laughs> it's great. There's a question. Yeah, there's a question. I can't see the light. Can I sorry. Use the microphone or can you hear me? We can hear you. We can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> I can't see you because there's a light straight on me, but I can hear you. Oh, no. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> we, we will tell you about the secret history so, of that well, secret. That's what I'm asking you. How much of that was based on history? How much was the author? Oh. The author is uh, Jeffrey Wright. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
but read, read Ghost River instead of Secret River. Yeah, 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 that's it. <laughs> no, do it. And that's, that's by that no, man called it. Tony mm. Birch. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Bruce. Yeah, they are, and Cloud Street's a little bit older, but it's still in the top ten of the teaching. Um, but they actually write good apologies for white people, and that's why they're still in the curriculum. And Tim Winton's the same. He's, you know, quite an environmentalist. He's had a yeah. lot to do with Aboriginal people. So, you know, um, we're not saying that they're, they're excellent writers, but they've had to write in a perspective and a context that suited their readership. Thank you, everybody. Hopefully you can stay for the next round. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.